Welcome, everybody. This is For the Love of Money, where we are making you unapologetic about your pursuit of success by sharing the tools, tips, and stories of those who have already made it. My name is Chris Harder, and each week I will bring you incredible guests in order to prove that when good people make good money, they do great things. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another amazing episode of For the Love of Money. Now, I am really excited to sit down with a gentleman named Dan Kuschel today because he is literally an expert in coaching people's businesses to the next level. As a matter of fact, he's got 25 years of doing this. I mean, he's coached thousands and thousands and thousands of people from over 180 different niche industries. And when you've coached so many different industries, you realize it's your system that makes people successful. And he shares so many parts of his system with us in this interview. So make sure you stick with us all the way to the end because Dan is a regular media contributor. I mean, he is always on ESPN, NBC, Speed, Thrive, Huffington Post, you name it. We are honored to have him here today and he delivers massive value to you. So get ready, take some notes because here we go. All right, Dan, my friend, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's a pleasure to be with you, Chris. Thanks, man. I've been looking forward to this ever since Mike connected us. I know we went back and forth trying to make it happen, but you know what's meant to be certainly happens, and, and here we are today, so I can't wait. Yes, I think for both of us, we demonstrated what one core quality of most successful people, which is persistence, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Kudos to you on that. Kudos to you on that. Persistence is is the ability to go even though when people are saying no. Uh, so persistence was both of our middle names on this one. Uh, I love it. Well, it was meant to be and, and we made it happen. You know, on my show, just to pick up the pace and let everybody get to know you in a fun, fast way, I usually start with a series of rapid fire questions. Are you down? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So I'm going to start real easy. Where'd you grow up? Uh, Detroit, Michigan, off of Springwells and Verner Highway. Ah, fellow Midwesterner. I knew that I was going to like you. And where do you live now? I'm in uh, Arizona, uh, West Side, Goodyear, Arizona. Perfect. Favorite quote? Oh, golly, there's so many of them. I think I would have to say my favorite quote is, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail from Tony Robbins? Oh, and I could give you a hundred so others, but that's one. So good. What is one of your superpowers? One of my superpowers, simplifying the uh, the ability for a business owner to get clients. Oh, we're totally going to talk about that. Yeah, in a steady, in in a very steady, predictable way, non-reliant on referrals, non-reliant on networking, non-reliant on shaking the trees and personal hustle or charm, literally having an automated machine do it. We are definitely circling back to that because I know that's one thing that my listeners absolutely would love to tap into. What's one of your all-time favorite books? All-time favorite books, uh, Think and Grow Rich. And uh, uh, let me add another one most people have never heard of, but it had a huge impact. My dad got it for me as a birthday gift when I was in my late teens. And this is all the way back in the 80s, by the way, so I'm now dating myself, uh, Chris. <laughs> and it's a book called Mentally Tough by James Lore: How to Apply Sports Psychology to Winning in Business. Ah, interesting. I might have to check that out. I'm an avid reader, and that sounds pretty cool. What is one thing that you're afraid of right now? One thing that I'm afraid of right now, um, well, heck, I've got a 10 and a 12 year old. My daughter's 12. My son is 10. And my MO over the years has been, I'm, I, I suffer from a respectable addiction. I have several addictions, but one of them is, that shows up today actively is my workaholism. And so I would say that my, the thing I'm you know, scared of the most is that I lose sight of my boundaries because it's easy for me to work. 20 hours a day and do that for like years straight. I just have this type of uh, way of going about things and, uh, and not being present with my kids. And it took a near kind of fatal experience for me to kind of shift into a better, more healthy way of living. But it's easy for me to fall back. And so I am always constantly checking and thank goodness my wife really gets me. And so she gets me to check in too. But if I had to pick something, that would be it. We are definitely circling back to that. Cause I know that is another epidemic among listeners. Who is someone who has changed your life? Oh, wow, man. There has been, I mean, there's been so many, right? You have the serendipitous ones, the people that kind of just came in for a brief moment. Uh, But if I had to pick 
Well, I, I mean, I'm going to have to say my dad. My dad introduced me to personal development when I was 10. I went to my first event, which was actually geared for coaches. It was a clinic in in Michigan. It was uh, at in Ypsilanti at a, at a uh, baseball clinic, Eastern Michigan University, where I got to meet the coach. And to this day, I can still, Chris, picture the manual that I got because there was a section in there that really stuck with me and I can still visualize it like it was yesterday right now, which uh, the section was called positive mental attitude PMA it said success in life and in baseball or in sports is more than 90% mental, the rest physical. Mm. So my dad introduced me at 10 and then he kind of encouraged me along the way with personal development, working on mindset. And I, you know, really grateful for that, uh, I guess, support, uh, overall. So I'd have to say my dad, very cool. Dan, what is one of your all-time favorite accomplishments so far? Oh, favorite accomplishments is this past football season with my son being able to coach, be able to be present, to be able to, you know, pick him up when he needed it, to be understanding, not to treat him like the typical prototype coach's kid mm -hmm. and, and keep those boundaries. And then also, I mean, one of the joys I had was being able to you know, he's a quarterback. And so being able to call plays for my son and interact with him as this little, you know, quarterback. And I remember one point we were having conversations and I was like, well, what do you want to run? And he'd tell me and I go, okay, well, let's run that play. I was letting him call his own plays as well. So it's pretty <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. You know, I don't have kids yet, but that's kind of what I dream of secretly. I'll be happy boy or girl, but I would love to have a son that plays football that I could coach. That would be a dream come true. A couple more real quick rapid fire questions here. What's one regret that you have? One regret, um, you know, I shared a little bit earlier that, you know, I've had a tendency to uh, suffer from that respectable addiction workaholism. I'd say the first at least decade, I've been in business uh, building and growing 11, uh, now 12 companies, Chris, since 1992. So I've been at this a bit. And I would say at least for the first decade, maybe even 12-ish years or so, I didn't really enjoy a lot of all that I had built. I mean, I've been blessed to build several uh, seven-figure companies, multiple eight-figure companies. I've bought companies, sold companies. I've certainly had my fair share of success, by the way. I've had three companies I had to bury in the backyard. <laughs> they were <laughs> miserable. You know, it's like that commercial, you know, the pit of misery uh, type of thing. But the, the, the thing I regret is not really enjoying the process more and enjoying the, the memories that I was building. It was like, what can I do next? Let me scratch this off my to-do list. And today I'm in a much healthier place where I've realized that the to-do list is one thing. The not to-do list is more important. The not now list is important, but more importantly, it's about enjoying all these kind of moments, even the struggles. Interesting. Last rapid fire question. What is something generous that you have done recently, Dan? Generous. Well, I would say I, I try to live my life in generosity uh, overall. So whether it's you know, helping, you know, somebody who just needs to have a door held open uh, to donating, you know, time or donating money to different groups or organizations. Uh, you know, those are important for me and my family. Um, I took up my buddy, um, uh, uh, it posted a challenge to some people to focus for a week minimally on being able to, you know, be more environmentally conscious in the, in your neighborhood. And so I took him up on the challenge and I, uh, w basically I was seeing paper in the street and this sort of thing. So I was just actively trying to be a good leader for my kids too, to just be aware of some of the weird stuff that we'll find out there and, and be a good person and just pick it up. So that's one example of many. Oh, I love it. Sounds like you've got that family life really dialed in. We're, we're going to come back and visit some of that. So let's go a little deeper in the interview. And, and I actually want to circle back to one of the rapid fire answers that you had. You said your dad introduced you to personal development at age 10. Now, I don't want you to feel like you have to date yourself, but could you give us like a rough estimate of what year this was or... So at 10, I would, it would have been 1979. Yeah. Okay. Here's why I want to circle back. In 1979, this was not commonplace. Like personal development wasn't talked about the way it is today. There weren't stages, you know, with the next great personal development figure up there. There weren't e courses There weren't, it really wasn't a culture of any of that. So was this kind of ahead of its time for your father to bring you? And did this shape what you do today? Oh, I believe so. I mean, I think, um, Chris, my perception is that, first of all, being an entrepreneur, owning a business, building and growing companies 
is the greatest personal development platform in the world all by itself, <laughs> right? Um, because, it, I mean, you as a business owner, as you're listening right now, you'll go more through more st- stuff, I'll just call it. I could use some other mm-hmm. fancy language around it, but more stuff in a week than most people deal with in a year, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like this compressed, collapsed time capsule that you're in, right? The second platform that I found that also mimics that is sports. And so sports is another great, you know, builder of, of these, I'll call it the entrepreneurial type traits. Overall, it's performance based. You know, you have drama. You're going to have failure more most times and depending on the sport, of course, more time than you than you succeed. So you have to learn. It builds character. I mean, so so that's it. And then the actual act of my dad getting me to the these clinics when I was 10. And really, again, the kids like me weren't supposed to be there. Like my dad just kind of brought me along as a coach's kid and. I got to sit in and I actually got a ton out of it. Like I remembered there were all kinds of drills they were sharing for the coaches to be working. I mean, I came back out of that. I studied this book. I mean, it became my Bible for, you know, five to seven years. And my dad moving forward, he introduced me to a program. He introduced me to visualization, which was also ahead of its time when I was 15. And I can remember it. There's a, a program, you can go look it up on YouTube or whatever called uh, cyber vision. And they used to have it for golf and bowling and, and uh, skiing and uh, tennis, and they had one for baseball, which was my sport growing up. And I remember the cyber vision was all about um, how to tap into your subconscious mind for peak for peak performance. You know, basically it was way ahead of its time in neuroscience. I know that's kind of a new term today, but that I was studying this stuff all the way back in the in, in the eighties, like the early eighties. And, uh, you know, again, I didn't know it at the time, how fortunate I was, but I mean, you can apply visualization, like picturing yourself, like as you're listening right now, imagine or picture yourself at your peak, you know, and it follows a Picasso quote, which is, if you can imagine it, it's real. And they found proof. And so this program was one of those, there's all kinds of science around this. Um, so, so. I was very fortunate. Certainly, it's been a catalyst. I'd like to think I'm. A, I'm kind of a slow learner, Chris. I'm kind of like my wife even has said at times I'm a bull in a china shop, if not a hundred percent of the time, <laughs> being this type A driven personality type. Um, so I'm a little bit of a slow learner because I just, you know, I'll go for something first and then kind of learn my way through it. Whereas some people have to learn it first, then go do it. Whereas I, I just dive in when I find something I'm excited about, committed to, and all that sort of thing. But I think sports taught me that. Like, you know, when you play, like for me, baseball, basketball, football were, were the things I did growing up. Baseball especially. I mean, you fail typically, you know, in the younger ages, it's more like you fail six out of ten times. But at the higher levels, it's at least seven, if not eight, closer to eight out of ten times. You have to learn how to deal with failure and make adjustments. And that's really what life's about too, right? It's about adjustments. It's being able to be flexible and adapt, whether it's being collaborative with other people, which is the ultimate skill, uh, tapping into others' talents and abilities, you know, and and not focused on the how or the what, but really the who. And if you can tap into the who, which is a collaborative uh, framework in and of itself, I mean, you can go accomplish anything. (laughs) It's absolutely fascinating, the head start that you got to, you know, being exposed to all this, especially through sports. I can't agree with you more. What was the first business that you started? Uh, First business technically was a network marketing company. I started a a network marketing business. I think it was called, um, I want to say it was called New Skin. Oh, sure. Very familiar. Yeah, skincare program. So I got introduced to that. But my just a little bit ahead of that, my sister had got me a position uh, Chris, in a direct uh, response marketing company that at that time, this is pre-internet, if you can imagine back that far, you know, three decades almost. So this was uh, would have been in like 85-ish mm-hmm. or so. Mm-hmm. And I got in this role and I got so fascinated, Chris, with the idea how like you could put mail in out and send it to specific people that you could actually choose who it would go to, right? So in other words, targeting all the way back then. Uh, you could target your your mailer, then you could put very specific messaging that compelled people to take action, if not buy. And we would do this in mail. We did it in radio. We did, and I got so fascinated with the psychology of human behavior and how people would actually take these actions with these things. And then fast forward after a couple years doing that, I started my first official company, which was my first seven figure company, which was in 1992. 
Okay, so I'm kind of fascinated. Before we get to that first seven-figure company, what did network marketing teach you about business? I mean, you, you said it yourself. You've started so many seven-figure businesses, so many eight-figure uh, businesses. You've sold businesses, the whole nine yards. Did you learn anything from your network marketing experience that helped those? Oh, golly, yeah. I mean, outside of sports, Chris, I don't know if you're like this, um, you know, or if you're listening right now, if you can relate to this. But for me, the only place I was really comfortable in my own skin or in, in life actually was on a sports field. Like if I was on a baseball field, I mean, you'd see the leader in me come out, right? Mm -hmm. If I was on the basketball court, you know, I, you would see that leader in me come out. If I was on, in a, on a football field, you'd see that leader. But if you got me like outside of that platform, I was this shy, quiet, introverted, very self-conscious kid. I mean, I had, I'll give you an example. I mean, this kind of speaks you know, the biggest thing that it helped me overcome were a lot of my self doubts. And, you know, Hey, I, I won't claim that I've even perfected that today. I mean, I have insecurities and doubts and fears and all these sorts of things, uh, even now, but back then what I recall is it, it helped me break habits. It helped me break old belief systems, right? Which I think is the ultimate thing that we're all working towards is like breaking old habits, old rituals, old, old patterns and false belief system to really stretch ourselves to be the very best of ourselves. And for me, like I had teeth that were like very, uh, like if you'd look at me back then before my braces, cause in my, my parents couldn't afford, uh, braces all the way back then. So I had to get my own. And so I did, I funded it and got it my, my own, but I was very self-conscious of even smiling. Wow. And so I would even talk like, out of the side of my mouth. I still actually carry that because I developed that kind of habit, unfortunately, to some degree. Um, and I kind of talked where I didn't completely open because I didn't want people to see. I had these teeth that were just, I mean, it was like looking at my, I had my great friends. You know how friends are. They just bust on you, right? Mm -hmm. So I had one friend of mine, he would call me 99 rows of teeth. <laughs> oh, that's brutal. So, yeah. So to just kind of put that for, so I had that and then uh, that company, I told you that direct response, as much as I was fascinated and fell in love with it. And I started studying all the top experts back then and Tony Robbins and Tom Hopkins were my first couple and Brian Tracy was not, uh, not, uh, really soon behind that. But I dove into a lot of these self-education type programs and I just, I just love the I idea of it. And I had a, the owner of that particular direct response company told me, he goes, you'll never be any good at sales because people can't look at you because of your smile. Wow. Your teeth are so jarred. And by, by the way, like when you say that to like a certain type of personality, hint, hint, maybe me, <laughs> like you tell me I can't do something, <laughs> like well, I'm going to figure out a way around it. And, yeah. and so I got braces and I you know, overcame that, you know, false belief and, you know, but, but I know I had some of that. Another thing, you know, my upbringing was one where, you know, we were poor. We, you know, at times my family was on welfare. My dad who worked for a big auto company was laid off a bunch. I mean, it was a lot of ups and downs. There were times our electricity was shut off. So I had a lot of financial, I'll call it just baggage, like related to money or, or scarcity issues. Mm -hmm. And so these, these things help me just have a better version of like, you know, what is abundance versus scarcity, right? And, uh, and, and also I think the other thing that it's done coming from these backgrounds, is these are great places to be from, you know, as part of your journey. Mm -hmm. They're just not great places to stay. So like what could, you know, if someone is listening right now, what could you take from my, my story? Cause you might not be able to relate to any of it is this like, it doesn't matter where you've been. doesn't matter where you've gone. It just matters. Like really like, where do you, where do you want to go today? Like, what can you imagine? Right. You know, take that Picasso quote. If you can imagine it can be real. What can you imagine today? So we already heard how many successful companies that you have started, bought, sold, et cetera. But you just brought something very interesting up. You said you had scarcity issues and, and you had to work through those. We talk a lot about that on this show. How did you work through those scarcity issues in order to become as successful as you are today? Day to day, <laughs> right? Um, I would say, I would say it was a process. I would say that it, you know, most of it had to do with belief systems, false belief systems, mindset, right? Um, you know, like in one of my first books I wrote, Chris, I talked about this pretty regularly. Like for me, like I thought sports for me was going to be my way out of the city, which in many ways it was because it's you know, some, I'm fortunate to have some scholarships and stuff. Um, 
for school and that sort of thing. But I thought it was going to be much bigger. And my bigger vision at that time was I was going to help my family. Like I really wanted to help take care of my mom and dad, which I've, I've been fortunate to do in different ways today. Um, so getting through those, I had this vision that I could do something. I thought it would be one thing. It ended up being another. But I still had to go through, you know, a financial education, right? I think one of the biggest problems today is the lack of awareness around finances, right? Simple things like saving money, credit card debt, interest rates. Um, so I had to learn those kind of the hard way. And, you know, just being transparent, I mean, in my history, Chris, you know, I've been through bankruptcy. Man, that's no freaking fun at all, man. That's, it sucks. <laughs> Um, and that was a mistake. And I, you know, I have some regrets around that to a degree, although it taught me a better way of being educated about, you know, finances and a better way of managing money and, and all these things. And then, you know, now fast forward today, like, like I've, I've reviewed like 4,000 and some change businesses in the last just few years, like reviewed their business, their model, their, you know, many of them, their financials, all these sorts of things. And it's still interesting to me, even some high level people that are very successful, the basics of finance, understanding profit and loss statements, right? Understanding, you know, a lot of, I, I'll say for me, for so long I was intimidated. So I kind of just shoved it over in a corner and like suppressed it and didn't look at it. And I, mm -hmm. you know, and I had this belief, oh, uh, more sales will just solve all my problems. Yep. <laughs> right. Which there is some truth to that, <laughs> right? There is some truth, but it's not the full truth. And unfortunately, when you don't have the full truth, something's missing. It's not a 360 degree circle, it's like a 160 degree circle. And you could be getting so much more if you just got, and it's not becoming a PhD at some of this stuff. It's just getting an understanding, some basic fundamentals. You know, it's like the old uh, you know, John Wooden. I became a huge fan in sports of John Wooden, his practical psychology and his fundamentals that he used to teach. I mean, he would have his players come in at the beginning of every single season, whether they were a freshman, whether they were a senior and anywhere in between, they would come in and he'd walk them through the fundamentals to start the year. And he'd teach them literally how to put socks on. Wow. He would teach them how to tie their shoes. So, you know, it's the old ad. I think I heard this from uh, you know, a martial arts teacher. I think I've heard versions of this from the late Chet Holmes, which is so many people get so focused on at trying to learn and master like thousands of things. When in reality, uh, what, what is better our service for all of us is to focus on mastering 10 things, mm. right? Or even better, focus on mastering one and then surround ourselves with the other complementary people who've mastered the other nine things. And now you've got 10 things you've mastered. <laughs> wow. So, so those, of, are, those are a handful. Speaking of mastering and helping people master business, I mean, you've literally coached thousands and thousands and thousands of people from, you know, 180 different industries, like you name it, business, put any one of them in front of you, doesn't matter, you can help somebody with it. So my question is this, earlier you said you help clients simplify their process of attaining more clients. Can you walk us through that? Because that's an area that everybody would love to get better at. Yeah, and of course it's deep, right? I mean, there's layers of this and, you know, how do you take, you know, Thir almost 30 years of experience, many mistakes by, again, just as a reminder, I don't want anybody to think I've like just everything I've done has been of success because it hasn't. I mean, I've had my fair, fair share of, of failures and, you know, the, ideally I learn from those and then I can help people eliminate those mistakes. And so it's like, you know, yeah, how you like many times figure things out out of necessity, right? Mm -hmm. And like you just beat your head against the wall for so long and you go, there's got to be just a better way. So for me, that's kind of been my my evolution. So as I, I view it with client acquisition, I see just a few key pieces to it. Right. And I and I'm not, I don't mean to oversimplify it, but in many ways, I think I learned part of this, Chris, from Gary Halbert. Right. Okay. So he says the late Gary Halbert said that you only need three things in a, in a business. Right. Uh, and I'm going to add to this a little bit. But his three things that he said is you need a product service, you need a sales message and you need a delivery system, mm -hmm. right? And so many people overcomplicate and do like way more things that are outside of those three. But he said it, uh, those are the three key things you need, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to add my layers to this building on Gary's platform, which is, as I look at where do I see, where have I struggled 
in my history of my career, like the companies that I had to bury in the backyard that were like the pit of misery, if you will, instead of, uh, you know, the other option, um, were based on the fact that number one, you know, the product, I focused on the wrong things with the product or service, right? Now, what is that? Uh, you know, we can talk about it like we, we call this the BOAT framework, B-O-T-E. It's a real simple acronym, B-O-T-E, Breakthrough Outcome Transformation Experience. So, you know, the uh, Naveen Jain, who I got a chance to meet in a group called Genius Network. Yeah, I know Naveen. Yeah. So Naveen, he's, he's, he's so funny, right? If you talk to Naveen, like yeah, if you ask him, well, how do you go build a $10 billion company? He goes, oh, it's really easy. Just help a hundred, <laughs> hundred billion people. Yep. True. Like, and he just says it as matter of fact is like you and I, like, uh, what are you having for uh, that coffee there? Well, I'm going to have the cappuccino that like, that's how simple it is for him. Right. Yeah. And, and part of it, cause he lives in that space. Right. So, you know, the idea is like, what is the transformation, the breakthrough, the outcome experience that you create for your clients and stay focused on your clients, not you, not your message, but the message to them, like you always focus on, on you and you're getting, here's what it does for you. Here's what it means for you. Here's what it will, uh, uh, here's what the outcome for you will be. Here's what, and stay truly. So I've made the mistake of not doing that, right? Focusing on B O T E for them. So that's one. The other part is the offer, right? I, and it's so funny, Chris, because you know how you, sometimes you go for full circle. I don't know if you've experienced this, but oh, yeah. you had something that worked and then it worked so well, you got freaking bored with it. Mm -hmm. Right. It's and, almost and an what epidemic happened, for us over here. Yeah. Then you stop doing it. Right. And yep. then you kind of and then you come back and go, oh, that was actually something I could have should have kept doing. <laughs> <laughs> that was working pretty dang good. Well, I, I've probably done that a thousand times. Um but here's how I would simplify that. It's, it comes back to somebody's offer, right? Now, what is an offer? So, you know, we can have an offer that convinces people or we can have an offer that compels people. Another way to view it is what is your model around your offer? Is it a, is it a model or an offer that is a selling offer, a, sell, a selling offer or a selling model? Or is it a buyer's model, buyer's culture? In other words, do you have to sell it or do people just buy it, mm. right? By the way you stru we structure our offers, as you're listening, right, is the way you structure your offer will determine, like, do you have a, a model that's more of a selling culture or one that's a buying culture, right? The, I think fast forward 10, 15, 20 years as things continue to go the way they're going, Chris, I believe that people will are going to resonate with those companies that build their culture around a buyer's culture and and the companies that are built on a selling culture are going to be gone. I just believe that in my heart. I would have to believe that too. Yeah. And here's, here's the, like a differentiator for it to kind of, kind of bring it to, to a level where it's more than just theory. So Apple, right? Well, people line up for Apple products, right? And they're more expensive <laughs> and we'll line up for it. And nobody sells us these products. We just buy them, it's right? So it's true. a culture of buying Starbucks. Another good example. You know, we're not sold Starbucks, which is four times than just a typical cup of coffee that you can get at McDonald's for whatever the price is. I don't, I don't know uh, exactly, <laughs> right? Or you look at a, a niche coffee company that's one of the fastest growing and the only in its niche, like Bulletproof Coffee run by mm -hmm. Dave Asprey, right? Um, these are buyers' cultures, not selling cultures, right? So now what you might say to yourself is, you're like, okay, well, Dan, now I kind of get that, but how do I create my buyer's culture. Now there's more to this, but I want to give at least a framework to think about how do you create your amazing, compelling offer for people to buy it from you, not having to be sold it. So it starts with a couple of things. One, and I'm going to use uh, Dave Asprey as the example here in a minute, but Dave, um, as I've assessed his company, I got a chance to know Dave a little bit through Genius Network. Uh, looking from the outside in, I see a few things, but every offer ideally we'll have these four layers in them. Number one is like, what is the unique market that you go after? Key, for, key phrase here, unique market, not mm -hmm. just market. You know, there's a lot of people who go, you know, do the avatar exercise, focus on your market, focus on, yeah, this goes beyond that and goes deeper. So it's the unique market. What is the unique message of what it is you offer, what is the unique method in how you deliver it, and then what is that offer? And there's more, but those are good, really simple starting. So let me give you an example of my assessment of Dave uh, Asprey and Bulletproof 
coffee, which is again one of the fastest growing in the in the in the world right now. So his unique market, right? Think about this. Like ideally, as you're listening, you you can put connect the dots for your niche or your industry as it relates to how I share Dave's story and his his methodology. So his unique market, he looked at and said, there's people who are in the fitness industry who love drinking coffee, mm-hmm. right? Yep. But most of the brands have gone out in the coffee. And what do they do? They just focus on people who drink coffee. He niched it. He got a unique market of fitness enthusiasts who, who like drinking coffee. Something so that sometimes his... people are afraid to do. Niche exactly. it down that much. Yeah. And what, and it's, and I, and I, I've fallen into this trap myself, Chris, and I still deal with this. And like, you know, the clients we advise and such, we run into this all the time, but here's what I have truly found. If you can just let go to test it, just call it a test. Because you can always go back to the broader market. But here's what I have found. When you actually niche down, you actually attract more people anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You don't think that that's going to – because it's more of like the scarcity thing, right? And we all deal with it probably in one way or another. But if you'll just let go and just go, okay, I'm just going to test narrowing it down mm-hmm. to see what happens. Because I can all – yeah, what, what's the worst? I can always go back and market to the masses, to everybody. Niche it down. And what you'll find is you'll attract so many more than you think is, is, has been my experience. So, so his is fitness enthusiasts who like coffee, his unique message. What is his unique message? So his unique message is, uh, simply, uh, get fit while you drink coffee, right? Which Nobody is ever- a unique message in the coffee world. It really is. Exactly. Compl- very unique. Right. And nobody in the market had ever gone to both fitness and coffee and combined them. Similarly, the message is unique. Then that goes to his unique method. Well, how do you do this? Well, you add grass fed butter to your coffee. Well, who would have thought that? Like you know, it would have such amazing properties <laughs> that it would do this. And and lo and behold, he was kind of the, the leader of the pack. Now, others have kind of tried to knock that off. And he's added some other nuances, but the core of it was based on adding grass-fed butter to coffee, right, to get those extra. And whether you got his coffee or not was irrelevant. It was the that unique method that captured people's heart and soul, mm. right? And then his unique offer today is now called Bulletproof Coffee. And it's right? a smashing success. Smashing success. So, like, as you're listening right now, how could you structure your four layers of your unique market, your unique message, your unique method, and your unique um, uh, offer itself, right? We have a client we worked with recently. His name is Dr. Scott. And Dr. Scott, you know, was focused on helping chiropractors do better online paid advertising to get clients. And he's really dang, dang good at what he does. And so we worked with him and we actually have a process where we unpack and help people come up with this, like a we do it with you and we help you build it. Well, we went through this process. Dr. Scott came out of it, Chris. And what happened is he went from serving clients, you know, and they were paying him like $500 a month for the service and really darn good at what he does. But he, he wanted to attract more higher caliber, higher affluent, higher value kind of clients who also appreciate him and his team doing what they did a whole lot more. So we were able to re- rejuvenate his packaging this way with the, with this process and he now calls his process the patient infusion method. And literally, he can guarantee you he will fill your fill your seats as a doctor for your for your small events and conversion of those people to, to new patients that are giving you cash versus relying on insurance billing. He's really, really good at it. Well, he's gone. He went and when he made this transformation from, say, 500 a month to 5,000, he hosted a small event. And by the way, it wasn't like he had hundreds. We were just getting started. He had 11 people come to his first event where he hosted, was going to make this. And I had 11 people come. He did what he does, shared what he did. He got six people to enroll in his $5,000 a month or $60,000 a year ongoing program. Oh, wow. Right? And he's literally doing virtually the same thing he was doing for the people 500 that he was chasing and having a hard time, right? Because of his unique offer and his unique. Now, guess what he wants to do? And we are doing as a client. He's. He goes, that event works so good, I think I should do more of those. And we were like, yeah, that'd probably be a good idea. You should probably look at maybe two, three, four, five, six of those a year instead of like one. <laughs> <laughs> and he agreed, and it's going to add, it's on track. He's already in, in, a, in less than six months of us working just, and there's many other factors we, we worked with him on, but this was one critical piece. His business has already doubled <laughs> in less than six months. 
Wow, that's fascinating. So so I guess the message then is don't be afraid to niche down. Don't be afraid to get really unique. And you've even challenged me while you're talking. I've been thinking about the different um, verticals that we have. And are they unique enough? And and for some of them blatantly, no. And so I'm going to go back and visit, revisit that and say, how do we really make these more unique to truly speak clearly to the right people? Yes, Absolutely. I'll give you give you another example, right? With a, with a client we had worked with, uh, you know, Joe Polish and Genius Network, right? A lot of people know Joe, and and um, you know there were many many different factors, but Joe was already successful. He w- had built a very stable, profitable company, and he was going to be successful whether we had any role with him or not. So mm-hmm. let me just be clear on that. Uh, when we came in, I noticed some things that we could help with, and we were able to help support some things. But one of the things with with Joe not having a predictable flow of clients. Like the year before our company had, had gotten there, he had like 37 candidates for his big program called Genius Network. It's a $25,000 a year program, right? Which is pretty solid, 37, it's a couple a month, right? For that kind of commitment and, and the quality of people that he attracted. But most of that was based on Joe's hustle, him going out to events and traveling and doing what Joe does. And I said, there's got to be a better way. So we saw, looked at his assets, one of those being this key part here, which is related to the offer. Um, the other part was, how do you take the assets he's got and build like a machine to automatically, predictably create a steady flow of these candidates that you know will be there for him, not relying on Joe? So we put, it, put these things in place, and what we did is we were able to take it from that 37 a, a, a year uh, candidates' applications coming in to over 100 a month. Whoa. Right? And that's like the ultimate mastermind success story out there, by the way. Yeah. And he went from 67 members in Genius Network to now over 200 and some. It might be close to 220, last count. And then he has this annual event he hosts where that annual event prior to this process being in place, you know, he had he'd, he'd have an annual event that was mostly of his members and maybe 10, 12, maybe 15 people that would come. And it's a $10,000 event if you're not a member. Mm-hmm. Right. So 10 to 15 people is pretty good. But with this process, now this annual event sells out every year with well over what well, his members are over 200 plus over 100 plus people. And they've uh, at last count the last few years, they've actually had these uh, what do we call them? VIP lounges, like an overflow room mm-hmm. that those were also uh, filled up too. wow. Right. That's like every mastermind slash event hosts dream, by the way. Yeah, and you I, can I give you the secret of how to do it? Yes, I get please, to ask this frequently. Please. Okay, so so here's and I learned this from an old dude from years ago, and he said, you know, asked him how, how how did you get success, and here was a here was his response, and I wasn't the only one asking. Whether there were many of us in this room at the time, he goes, here's how you do it, um, here's how you build success: slowly, 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 <laughs> slowly. Then suddenly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, and the suddenly is what people see. They don't get to see the That's slowly right. and then they wonder what's wrong with them. Yeah. And so like Joe, like his, you know, I was, I, I came, Hey, let, let me just be real. I came into that situation, the right place, right time. A lot of great assets. I was able to leverage them, right? A little lever, you know, little lever can move some big things when it's done and put in place correctly. And I was able to help advance that. But Joe had 20 some years of all this amazing other assets that I was able to help just, take advantage of and capitalize on. And, uh, it yeah. has been, and you know, it, it, that, that's the thing most people don't recognize is there's so many assets we have little things, little hinges can swing those big doors. A, one domino can tip over 2000 mm-hmm. when yes. it's done right. And so I, I love looking, well, where is that one domino, Joe? Where is that one domino, Chris? Where is that one domino in your business where we can help you and we can help you create a, a huge momentum that takes it off of your shoulders. Mm, that's what everyone's looking for. What is that? That one tipping point, that one adjustment that they can make. So don't sell yourself short, by the way, in working with Joe, because obviously the details that you were able to work with him on made a big, big difference. Well, th- well, thank you. <laughs> hey, yeah, listen, thanks. I, I, I want to, there's something I also I wanted to ask you too. I know you, you know, this show is all about money mindset and, and millionaire mindset and all that stuff. And I know that you interviewed T. Harbecker. And yep. uh, I know you also had created something called the millionaire's mindset in the past. So, I mean, you're you do your research. You yeah. Your well, research. You're, you're, you're definitely a, an expert in this area. So I wanted to, to ask you a question about this because it's probably one of the biggest things that my audience continues to work on. So when you worked with T. Harv Ecker, what was one of the biggest lessons you took from him? And maybe a lesson that we haven't heard 
already. So this I didn't. I'm, I'm going to use a metaphor that I didn't get from Harv, but I, I was. I'll, I'll say that it, working around Harv got me to think of it this way, right? And then kind of bringing the two together. I think I first heard this also from Gary Helbert, which is, and, it, and it's a real easy visual, right? So if you pull out a one dollar bill out of your wallet right now, and you pull out a hundred dollar bill, right? Mm -hmm. And then you you put them on top of each other, mm -hmm. you'll notice something. And then if you hold them in your hand, you'll notice something, a few things. And I'm going to point out a few of these things. Number one, you're going to notice they're the exact same size. Mm -hmm. You're going to notice they're the exact same weight. You're going to notice they're the exact same color ink. There's only one difference between a $1 bill and a $100 bill. It's the message on the paper. Ah. So what is that message you're telling yourself, right? The subconscious mind has so much more to do with our mindset around money or success than we probably realize. And what can you do to start shifting your internal messaging? You know, it's an inside out type of proposition. So what are you doing to constantly feed the internal message of you, right? Garbage in, garbage out. What kind of amazing information transformation are you feeding it? When you put, call it hundred dollar messaging compared to dollar messaging in your, your internal mindset, Ultimately, it's the, the, you've got to be the person to do the thing that has to be done to take the action. And I have a tendency to get off on 12 different tangents, Chris. So I just remembered <laughs> a question you asked me about 20 minutes ago. And I'm going to circle that back too, which was early in my businesses, like I worked really, I've always worked really, really hard. Like growing up in a blue collar family and that sort of thing. I mean, it, it just was kind of ingrained in us, right? And for me, building businesses in my early, early years, I found that I, I mean, I was so motivated to make money because obviously when you don't have it, it's a big deal. <laughs> and I was hustling and hustling and hustling and grinding and grinding and grinding it. And it seemed like the harder I chased money, the further it actually got away from me. I know a lot Not of people the, feel that way, right? I wrote about this in my first, first book and I finally got to a point where I, I gave up internally like and this was the big transformation for me and this kind of ties in even with harv i was so focused on the result in other words the fruit of my labor right that old adage by your fruits you'll know them mm -hmm. so my fruit was money or lack of it and you know the internal fruit the seed was not as solid and i at one point i remember i was ready to walk away from business and entrepreneurship and you know, I remember going to one of my mentors telling her I was you know, you know, going to leave the industry and take a break. And what ended up happening was I, I let go of all my financial goals and I started focusing on me as a human being. Mm. And that's where I, I, I forget where I learned it. I didn't invent it, but it, it's just a symbol. I'm a person that like, if you tell me I need to read an hour, I'm not I, like I'm bailing. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you tell me, Hey, why don't you just try reading for five minutes or exercise for 10 minutes a day or I'll do like the simple thing. I'm, a, I'm just a simple kind of person. So for me, it has to be like short and very condensed and consumable, like these long drawn out process. I mean, they suck for me. They just don't work. And so I came up with this process for me that worked. And then I've now shared it with thousands and people seem to resonate. So it's, it's essentially I, I use a journal, but you can write it on a piece of paper. It doesn't have to be a journal. It could be a note or whatever. But it's three questions that were the foundation. Now, I ask different questions today because it can get monotonous if you just keep doing the same thing all the time for mm -hmm. 15 years. I found <laughs> it took me a couple years to realize that. And it took me also 15 years to realize, you know, I have control of this. I can ask different questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, who would have thought? Um, but anyway, uh, so the three questions that serve me really well may serve you as you're listening are, uh, and, and totally transform my money game, which is what am I grateful for right now? Hmm. Right? Leading with gratitude and truly living in that spirit of gratitude. Uh, the second question is, what am I happy about right now? Right. And then the number three thing, which for me was critical because I've always been pretty self had been. Let me put that in the past uh, had been self-critical, meaning I'd beat myself up. If, even if I was doing great things, I'd find something wrong that I did, etc. Mm -hmm. And so what did I do well today? And I just started noting like five to 10 things a day, twice a day. And I did that for several months and then it went to once a day. And I can share with you, Chris, 
that I live from this place today. Like when I take, like you asked earlier as well, like what, what are you uh, really excited about? My, being able to go to bed with my kids and ask them one of these three questions and just get their feedback and have them grounded and having a spiritual, whether it's prayer or just acknowledging a higher power, whatever that is, your belief systems is such a gift, right? That there is something bigger than all of us out there and being able to commit to serving something greater than ourselves Mm -hmm. is, is so powerful. And for me, that switch of moving from me focused of trying to get money to be just grounded, grateful and happy. And I'm doing great no no matter what became like my, I, I would say it's probably the biggest thing that's transformed my world. It's not a business tactic. It's not a sexy tactic. There's people in many different ways have shared versions of this over time, but I can share with you. If you will just take five minutes a day and acknowledge these three questions, a couple answers for each of them, your life will change. Do you journal them or just think about them? I will say that I do both today, right? I'm not going to, I'm not one of these coaches or people that go, oh yeah, I do this a hundred, and then you go hang out with them and find out they're full of it, right? Mm -hmm. I'm I've met a bunch of those. I'm sure you have. Oh, yeah. Um, so I, I spend probably about 50% of the time now it's in my journal. And the other 50 is just, you know, I can't, I, I do it 100% of the time with my kids. Wow. That right? is amazing. Before they go to bed. So. What am I grateful for right now? What am I happy for right now? And what did I do well today? That's important. I mean, I think the majority of people listen to a, a show like this. They're hard chargers. They got big dreams. They're trying to get better every single day. And so by default, I think they suffer from the same thing that you talked about. I know I do. And as you're really hard on yourself, like way too hard on yourself. Mm -hmm. And so these are really great questions to focus in on at the end of the day or middle of the day or wherever somebody feels like it's going to serve them best. So I've got just a couple more really quick questions for you. You've given so much great value so far. I'm I'm so grateful, Dan. But before I ask you the last couple of questions, where can we find you? Where can we follow you? Where's the best place to check into some of your expertise? Yeah, the the best way to do that, Chris, is we have a rotating on-demand training platform that we we've built, and uh, I think right now at the time we're 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 doing this interview, we have our, uh, the on-demand training. It's called the unusual three-step method to triple your business without high costs, more stress, or more staff. Okay. Right, and uh, you can go get access to that for free. Right, and. And uh, you can do that at championbusinessblueprint.com. That's championbusinessblueprint.com. We found there's three really critical things that most people seem to get stuck on as it relates to getting new clients. And that's what this is, this, pla- this uh, particular one is all about, getting new clients in a predictable way and kind of taking you behind the veil. So number one, we show you how to leverage millions of dollars in, in research, right, where you can quickly and easily create your winning sales model in your niche in, in 20 minutes or less, and it's free, right? And it also shows you how and uncovers how to demystify how to do that with paid traffic. See, I'm a big advocate of actually using paid traffic because mm-hmm. if you can make paid traffic work, even in small amounts, it makes it that much easier for referrals and joint ventures and some other things like that. So that's uh, strategy number one. Strategy number two is more, this one is more tactical, but we have stumbled into something and it's called the, the unique mini series traffic method that'll bring you perfect clients without requiring a website, without requiring a big risk. And you can test it for less than $20. Right. And it, I mean, it's amazing. Like I am shocked and surprised to this day, how well it is working where you can build audiences for pennies on the dollar, um, in this unique, fun, compelling way using this mini series traffic method. And then the third strategy is how to use the unusual, we call it the underground interviewed method, Chris. Okay. And what it does is it brings you sales without you feeling like you're being salesy, without you feeling like you're being slimy. Ooh, or a like lot of people like, will like that one. Yeah. And like you're having to sell your soul, right? So um, it's, and here's a little hint, like what we're doing right now is a version of it, yep. right? Yep. And the most successful people in the world utilize this. Oprah uses this strategy. You know, a guy named Colin Cowherd in sports uses this strategy. You use this strategy. I mean, a lot of the top most successful people around use this strategy. But there's a couple little nuances that can transform the game for you when you do it correctly and and can mean a lot. We've we've put this model, this this uh, unique interview method in place where we were able to have customer service people become top performers 
in what would traditionally be considered a sales company. Wow. That's awesome. Okay, Dan, I'm totally checking that out. I'm going to make sure that we put that in the show notes as well. The website, one more time. Championbusinessblueprint.com. Championbusinessblueprint.com. Very cool. I mean, that is definitely in one of those much needed tactical things, right? It's not just one of these hype things. So I love that. So, all right, last two questions. And I love these questions because we try and link generosity with success. And we try and link the fact that you know, when good people make good money, they do great things. We also try and encourage people to come up with new ways to give back. So this question is, what is one of your all-time favorite moments of giving? Oh, wow. There's, there's been a few. Uh, having the ability to contribute to uh, Richard Branson's foundation was a big honor and privilege to, to participate with Virgin Unite and a collaborative thing that Joe Polish and Yannick Silver set up many times over the years. Um, Another one has been the Boys and Girls Club here of the East Valley in Phoenix. I had a group of people in our company set up a fundraiser, and we were able to raise a whole a whole bunch of uh, money for kids over a few years. That's been a lot of fun. And then another one that's a really fun experience for you to do with your team, with your with your uh, family, is uh, you know donating time to Habitat for Humanity. A lot of people in need out there with homes or lack of homes, and you can go build a home. And there's just this bonding experience that happens uh, in this act of service. So, so, so those are a couple uh, overall. Plus, I would say I was good to my wife today. That's always a good thing. Oh, I love that. I <laughs> love that. And then last question is this. I love the responses to this one. Why should people be unapologetic about their pursuit of wealth and success? Unapologetic for their pursuit of success and wealth. Well, what would I say to that? That's a that's a an awesome question, Chris. I've never <laughs> I've never you. been asked that question. Unapologetic. It's like, in my opinion, it's you know go forth and prosper at this yeah. point, right? We, I mean, we're built to serve, and the ultimate service is contri- contribution. And as a business owner and entrepreneur, we create opportunities, we create jobs, we create momentum, we create you know like we talked about you create an ultimate personal development. Like I believe for our teams, even we're leading by example. So it's, it's really just in my opinion, a demonstration of being a service servant and service leader Mm. by doing what we do as an entrepreneur and the byproducts. Like, um, I, I think I heard this from Dan Sullivan of strategic coach money earned ethically is simply a byproduct of, um, value creation. Ooh, I love that. I mean, you gave a lot of value today, but that's good. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Dan, uh, I can't thank you enough. I mean, seriously, you, when I say you gave a lot of value today, you really did. You loaded us, you loaded us up with actionable tips, uh, good stories. So, you know, for the past, what is it, 51, 52 minutes, I can't say thank you enough. It, it's been a pleasure, Chris. Thank you, my friend. I look forward to us being able to help each other more down the road, too. Likewise. Thanks for listening. And if you loved this episode and know of someone else who is as successful as they are generous, please pass them on to me. It would mean the world to me if you help me get this cause and this message out to as many listeners as I can. So please, if you liked what you heard, it goes a long way if you take 30 seconds and leave me a five-star review and share this with your friends. I'll be forever grateful. And until the next episode, cheers to your success.